Titus chapter 1, and we're going to read just the first four verses. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, in the hope of eternal life that God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. In his own time he has revealed his word in the preaching with which I was entrusted by the command of God our Saviour. To Titus, my true son in our common faith. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as you uh, grab your service sheets there or your newsletters, you'll find an outline there. Uh, There'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. And if you're at home and you want to text in a question, Uh, Ali and Tim up the back have my phone and so they can read out that question if you want to text it through to my mobile number. Uh, And you've got your Bibles open there at page 1058, Titus chapter 1. I I love letters. Uh, I'm pretty old school when it comes to things like communication. Uh, I love letters. I like paper. I like fountain pens. I like writing. Uh, Letters are a form of literature that aren't just liked, but they're invaluable. As you just heard from Ben and Rocket, letters are a form of literature that reveal personal details, private details, significant details, details that are hidden from the public eye often. If you're a historian or an academic, you love them because they put flesh on the bones of history. Fans love them because they allow them to connect with celebrities. They write to someone famous, and that famous person, or at least one of their lackeys, sends them a letter back. And auction houses love letters, because people pay big money for private correspondence. Now, the key to understanding a letter, any letter, as Ben and Rocket pointed out, is understanding who wrote it, who got it, when it happened, and why it happened. Who wrote it? who got it, when it happened, and why it happened. But let me tell you that we're dealing with a letter completely unlike many of the letters that I've just hinted at. During the last week, I spent time reading a letter from Martin Luther King. I'd never knew this letter existed. It's called The Letter from Birmingham Jar. Uh, It brought tears to my eyes. Go go home and find it and read it online. I I also Googled a, a letter that Taylor Swift sent to one of her fans, which she hand-wrote and then decorated the envelope in watercolours for that fan. They're significant letters, but they're not nearly as significant as the letter we're looking at today. They don't have an eternal perspective. They don't rest on the nature of God for their significance. None of those letters transform lives publicly by revealing eternal truths. And none of those letters establish the earthly life of an eternal community. But this little letter that we're about to turn to now, a letter from a man called Paul to his young friend Titus, this letter does all of those things and even more. And we're going to spend a few weeks reading it together. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks for letters. Uh, Thanks for that image in our mind of a a man called Paul sitting down and uh, grabbing a quill and just scratching this letter out to his friend called Titus. Thank you that you've preserved it. Thank you that it's your word from Paul to Titus to your people. Father, help us to enjoy its significance and please apply its content to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, always good when you start a new book in the Bible uh, to see where it lies, if you like to get its geography, uh, to work out where it fits. Uh, if you look at the next slide up on the screen, you'll see that we're going to be spending a few weeks with this letter. If you're going to spend seven weeks with a piece of literature, you need to know where it fits in God's Word. 
Uh, There's a little outline there of our sermon series. You can pick one up at the back as you leave with the Bible study booklets and the household devotions. Uh, I'll email that out this week uh, when I send out the catching up email. But please, if you've got your Bible there, grab your Bible and see where Titus is physically. Uh, If you hold your Bible up and you put your finger in Titus, you'll notice that it's towards the back, Uh, that it's in the part of the Bible we call the New Testament. If you know your Bible, you'll see that it's there after the Gospels, after the good news biographies of Jesus. It's there after the book called Acts, where we have a description of God setting up the early church, putting his community around the world, the community of Jesus with Lord and Saviour. Next slide, if you remember the series we did two years ago, God's Big Picture, you'll remember that Titus sits just near that last column in the top slide in the area called the last days. God's people are waiting. They're in the now but not yet. Jesus is king, but he hasn't yet come back from heaven. And God's people sit in this in-between time going, how are we meant to live in this broken world with Jesus as Lord and Saviour waiting for him to come back? Titus is a letter written to a man and a group of people trying to work out what life looks like living as God's people as they wait for Jesus to come back. Does that sound familiar? Kind of like what we're doing now, isn't it? Living now, trying to work out what life looks like as we wait for Jesus to come back. And it's worthwhile stopping at this point, just with the first four verses, to think about those questions you need to answer when you deal with a letter. Who wrote it? Who got it? When was it written? And why was it written? This week we're dealing with the first two. Who wrote it and who got it? Next week we're going to deal with the next two questions. What was the context and why was it written? So look at verses 1 to 3 with me, and I'm at point 3 on the outline. Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. In the hope of eternal life that God who cannot lie promised before time began and has in his own time revealed his message in the proclamation that I was entrusted with by the command of God our Saviour. The author, it's very clear there. I love letters that are clear straight up. No confusion. The author is Paul. That's the Paul who we know by his original name Saul in the reading from Acts 9 that Max brought us. Saul, the killer of Christians. Saul, the man who got letters to go to Damascus in order to ferret out any Christian that might be in the synagogue so he could kill them. Saul, the man who on that road to Damascus met Jesus in a remarkable intervention by God where God reached down and spoke to him in a way he didn't deserve, where God reached down and gave him a revelation that he didn't merit, where God reached down and showered his lavish love on a man who hated God and hated his people. If you're listening carefully to that reading from Acts 9, that remarkably changed Paul, didn't it? It didn't just change his name from Saul to Paul. It gave him a completely new identity. It's a new identity we see there in verse 1. Did you see it? A slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, Before, this was a man opposed to God. Now, he's a slave of God. Let's not be too polite. Servant's too vanilla. He's a slave. God has grabbed him taken this hostile and violent man, given him a new postcode, remember Colossians? Moved him from the kingdom of darkness into the household of light and given him a completely new identity. It was there in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. This will be my chosen instrument to take my name to the world. Paul is commanded by God in his life. He is God's slave. Paul wants Titus and others to know that truth. 
In fact, outside Philippians and Romans, at no other time does he describe himself as a slave at the start of a letter. It's really quite quite unusual for Paul to do that. He wants them to know that he's under compulsion to obey God. God has reached down and grabbed him. But there's another part to his identity too. Before, he was killing anyone who talked about, followed or shared Jesus. Now, if you look in verse 1, he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's now a messenger, an eyewitness, someone who has to tell the world about what he has seen and experienced. Again, he's commanded to, but he's got a responsibility to. He now has authority to to take a message to the world that will change it, a message about Jesus. And that's his mission. Did you see his mission there in verse 1? Look back there at verse 1. Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, what's his job? For the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Paul's mission is clear. He's got to focus on God's mob. Paul's mission is clear. He's been given the job of helping God's mob know the truth and know the faith. Paul's mission is clear. As he helps God's people know faith and truth, they're going to represent God more clearly. They're going to be godly in the world around them. Now, the words are clear, but what does it actually mean? What does it actually mean? Paul's mission is to tell the world about God as Jesus has revealed God. Put very simply, go and tell the world about Jesus. Now, Paul doesn't have any option about the content. Paul can't make up the content based on how he feels on a certain day or how the audience is looking or how the community feels. Paul's got a very definite message to take to the world. Are we going to meet that in Titus chapter 2? But let me read for you from 1 Corinthians 15 how Paul describes it in another letter. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4. Now, brothers, I want to clarify you the gospel I proclaim to you. You received it and have taken your stand on it. You're also saved by it if you hold to the message I proclaim to you, unless you believe to no purpose. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received. Here it is that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. That's the message he's taking to the world. It's so simple you can remember it on five fingers, can't you? Christ died, was buried and rose for our sins according to the Scriptures. That's the message That's the truth. That's what Paul has to take to the world. He met it on the Damascus Road, didn't he? Because you can't deny it when a live bloke speaks to you when you thought he was dead. (laughs) That's what Jesus did. He met the resurrected Jesus. And at that point, all the pennies started to drop. All the pieces fitted together for Paul and he finally understood who Jesus was that Jesus had died, was buried and rose for his sins according to God's plan and that that message has to go to the world. That's the message that Paul is proclaiming. He's been given the job to proclaim it. He has the authority to proclaim it. You see it there in verse 3, that I was entrusted with by the command of God our Saviour. He's got the method. Did you see it there in verse 3? Proclamation. He's got to go around speaking to people This message about Jesus. Now, I want to just pause there for a moment because one of the accusations made against people who do a lot of speaking, I trust you, I've heard it, is that it's all just hot air. It's just words. It's just passionate speech. But did you notice that at the heart of Paul's mission, it's not just words? Did you see that in verse 1? The knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. It's not a matter of all talk and no walk. It's not a matter of semantics or hot air. This is a truth that changes people, must change people. 
It is a message of truth that has transformed this man from a killer to a converter, from a murderer to a messenger, and it will do the same to anyone else who has understood it truly. Paul's mission and message is focused on God's people knowing that truth and being so transformed by it that they show God to the world. The end point there in verse 1 is godliness, bearing the family likeness, showing that God's your father more and more in this world. Now, none of that occurs in a vacuum. It happens in real time and space. In fact, Paul gives us the perspective there in verses 2 and 3. Did you see it? Look there in verse 2. In the hope of eternal life, the God who cannot lie promised before time began and has in his own time revealed his message in the proclamation. Paul's perspective, it's eternal. The hope of life forever. It's a perspective that sees life as more than just breathing and surviving. It's a perspective on life that's so different to what we hear and read so much of of today. It's a perspective on life that sees it not just about avoiding risk, pain and brokenness, but sees that life is something that goes forever and is lived now. And it's not based on Paul just waking up and having a whim or a wish. Did you notice where that perspective comes from? It comes from the very nature of God, the God who made all things. It's the perspective that God himself promised that he has made human beings to live forever. And it's certain because of the very nature of God. Did you see that there in verse 2? Do you see how God's described? The God who cannot lie, who promises. God can't lie. So when God promises something, you can trust it, can't you? His very nature guarantees it. So if God promised it and designed it and revealed it and gave it, you can trust it. There's more to life than breathing, surviving and avoidance. Life is bigger than brokenness. Life is about eternity now and it's not hidden. It's been made clear. God himself has revealed it. Look there in verse 3. He's revealed his message in the proclamation. He decided it before time began, but now he's made it very clear in his word, the word that's spoken, the word that's written, the word that is proclaimed, and as we'll see in a few weeks, the word that walks around in the world, in Jesus Christ. So that's who wrote the letter. There's a lot there in those first three verses, isn't there? That's the author. Paul reveals his identity. He reveals his mission and message and perspective. His identity, slave and apostle. His mission, that God's people know the truth and are transformed. His message, well, it's given by God and it's about Jesus who lived, died and rose for our sins according to the scriptures. And his perspective... Life is bigger and is eternal. So who's he writing to? Who's he writing to? Look there in verse 4. To Titus, my true child in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. Well, the recipient's a fellow called Titus. Uh, His identity and relationship is there in verse 4. Did you see it there? Uh, Paul has a really deep affection for him. He is Paul's... True child, Uh, not a biological description, but a faith description. It seems that Paul has led this man to know and love Jesus too, as Paul has done his job. And they exist in a friendship that's bound by this truth. They share the same message. They share the same father. They share the same perspective on life. They share the same mission, as we'll see later on. Well, that relationship's expanded throughout the rest of the New Testament. We don't meet Titus very often. We meet him in a book called Galatians, chapter 2. He's described as going with Paul to Jerusalem to sit down and have a meeting with the other apostles. We're told there that he's not circumcised, so he probably wasn't a Jew. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we're told that he's a messenger for Paul. Paul sends him to take his message to different places, in this case, in Corinth. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul gives him a pretty tough job. So he's not just a messenger, he's a troubleshooter as well. So putting all that together, just from that verse and what we get elsewhere, Paul is writing to a younger protege, someone he's mentored, someone he's led to know and love Jesus. He's a bloke called Titus. They share the same message. They share the same father. They share the same perspective on life. And they share the same truth with those around them. Titus is not mentioned in the book of Acts. And that seems to suggest that what's going on here happened after Acts. After Paul got let out of jail for the first time in Rome. So there you go. We've answered our first two questions. The first two questions you've got to deal with any letter. Who wrote it and who received it? And there's a heap more to come. Ben and Rocket hinted at that, a location and a mission. But we've placed this letter within the geography of the Bible, haven't we? Remember opening up the Bible and seeing that Titus is at the back? It's in the New Testament. It's after the life of Jesus, after he's gone up into heaven. It's where God's people are trying to work out how to live in the world, waiting for Jesus to come back. It's written by a bloke called Paul, and we saw his identity, his mission, his message, and his perspective. It's there in the outline. We saw Titus. We saw who he was and what he was about. And we've understood a little bit of that relationship. So what? I've got bigger things to deal with like roadmaps and COVID and vaccinations and brokenness. What use is this kind of letter to someone like me? Or perhaps someone like you? Why would we read it? Certainly a question I've been grappling this week because I tried to work out why I put this as the sermon series for these few weeks. Why did I choose that back in September last year? What a goose. But let me tell you, as I've worked this week on these four verses, I've been helped to see how remarkably relevant they are to our times. And I hinted at it earlier on. I want to close with three very simple observations to draw some of that out. It is a letter from an older Christian to a younger Christian. It is private correspondence, but if you've got your Bibles open, turn with me to the last verse in Titus. Titus chapter 3, verse 15. In fact, I want, to, I want you to read just with me that last phrase, the last sentence. Grace be with all of you. Do you know the thing that I found out this week? That last verse is plural. The you is plural. That's a really strange way to end a letter between two people to an individual. It really caused me to stop and have a think because Paul closes this letter to an individual by referring to the whole community. A really neat way to finish a letter because it means that you think, actually, I've now got to go back and rethink everything I've just read, which I assumed was just for Titus. Because it isn't just for Titus, it's for all of you. It's for all of you. It's for the whole people of God. It's a private letter that is for the community. Now, that probably shouldn't surprise us, and you'll probably go, well, Bernard, why do we pay you? It took you that long to work that out? Paul's mission is for the faith of God's people. His commission is, in Acts 9, verse 15, for the whole global community. But when you finish that way, it pulls you up short and says, hang on, I've actually got to apply this to the whole mob. Not just dismiss it as a private conversation. It's for all of us. The second observation is this. This letter is concerned for the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Paul's mission is that people know the truth about Jesus. He died, buried, rose for your sins according to the scriptures so that you will represent God to the world. Be transformed. At the time Paul wrote this letter, God's people are right throughout the Roman Empire. Can you imagine trying to work out how to be someone who served Jesus' as boss when you've got the Roman Caesar over here? 
trying to grapple with what does it mean to serve Jesus as Lord and have Caesar over there. Uh, That grappling has happened for God's people right throughout history and it involves knowing the truth, reading God's word, and then living the truth so that God is shown to the world. Let me tell you that I think that's probably what we're going through now, isn't it? (laughs) Under COVID and roadmaps and our day-to-day life as God's mob here. Read God's word and then display that God to the world. Here are two ways this has affected me this week as I've thought about it. They might prompt some questions for you. Uh, In in a world, firstly, where all sorts of truth is affecting our behaviour, am I excited first and foremost about God's truth? About how God's truth sheds light on life. Uh, One Christian stated it this week or asked this question, are you as excited about God's word today as you are by learning the latest COVID-relevant information? What excites you most as you deal with the world? Which page are you turning to, the COVID page or the page in God's word? What excites you most? And when you think through that, secondly, is the truth of God's word, the promise of God about life, the revelation of Jesus Christ, is it actually changing me to reflect that God in this town? Put simply, as I read God's word, is it helping me reflect him more fully in this town? Oh, that caused me to pause this week and think about my language, my responses as I navigated the world. How was what I said privately and publicly displaying to those around me the same kindness that God displayed to me and to Saul on that road to Damascus? Third observation. The perspective granted by God's promise and truth is eternal and present. No denying that what Paul's on about is here and now. That's the world he operates in. But remember that the perspective is eternal. Life is eternal. And that's the promise of God. I watched an interview this week with an English minister. As some people here in Australia said, hey, you've been dealing with this since June. Got any words of wisdom for us? A terrific interview not least because he's sitting there and his three COVID-positive kids are playing on the floor in front of him. What wisdom do you have? And do you know what the first thing he said? The thing that I've learned is that life is eternal. And that has completely radically changed my perspective. Life is not about just breathing and surviving and avoiding risk. Life by God's design is bigger than that. It's about reflecting the nature of God as our Father to a broken world through Jesus Christ. The Father who finds killers on a road to Damascus and grabs them. The Father who promises eternal life to rebels by sending his Son to be killed by them. The Father who enables and equips his people to go out and show him to the world. And let me tell you, that brought me up short this week, (laughs) that perspective. It was caused me to think, uh, how have I been sucked into a view that reduces life? How can I live life now that displays God's eternal design and the bigness of existence? What could I possibly be saying this week that draws the attention of those around me to the fact that God as Father and Jesus as Saviour shows how big life is and how it lasts forever? Let me pray. Our Father, it, it's really a terrific little opening of a private piece of correspondence. Thank you uh, for preserving this letter for us. I thank you that we can meet Paul and Titus and Father, thank you that as we've looked at this passage today, we've seen that it is remarkably relevant for the times we live in as we deal 
with this world as your people grappling with how to show you as Father and to navigate the brokenness. Father, please help us to listen to all of this letter for all of us. Please help us uh, to be people who think about the truth that leads to godliness and please enable us to have the perspective of eternal life lived now. In Jesus' name, amen.